Now, I know that this is not horror. I know. But I'm a lore guy. I absolutely love lore and learning the stories behind games. Even more so when they are games that I played as a kid who was playing zero notice to the storylines. I absolutely loved the Hitman games whilst growing up. Nothing beats that nostalgic feeling of firing up either Silent Assassin or Blood Money, harking back to those days playing on a massive TV in my parents' living room on my PS2. Spending hours on levels so this bald-headed nutcase with a barcode on the back of his head could find crafty ways of taking out targets without raising suspicion. Again, I didn't even know what the story was, I just knew that the games were a lot of fun. But for some reason I just stopped playing. I became engrossed in franchises like Resident Evil, Silent Hill and Bioshock. Then I became a massive GTA fanatic. But then I stumbled onto the world of Assassination Trilogy in 2020 and again I was lured back in. I've been meaning to do a big Hitman video ever since and having bought all of the games and slogged through playing the very difficult and nightmare inducing Codename 47, if you've played it you know. I finally played through and captured footage from every single Hitman game in the franchise so far. I say so far as it's not really clear where developer IO Interactive want to take this franchise next. I need to mention before we kick this video off that they were a couple of mobile side games, the turn-based tactical puzzle game Hitman Go and Hitman Sniper which is basically Agent 47 sat on a hill shooting people in a compound. Anyway, due to these games not really having stories and just being side games, we won't be talking about them again in this video. I also do need to mention that due to the nature of these games featuring sandbox type levels offering you flexibility in how you conduct missions, some of my explanations may vary to how you played the game. Naturally, there will be spoilers for Hitman in this video, so you have been warned, but let's begin right at the start. In 1999, a man wakes up in a padded cell to the sound of a mysterious man over a loudspeaker telling him that they have work to do. And the voice refers to the man as 47. His cell door unlocks and then the man claims that he is the man he can trust the most. On the other side of his cell door is a suit and then 47 is taken through an obstacle course where 47 utilizes various weapons, showing an expert proficiency in it. Then 47 disguises himself as a guard or rather an orderly and escapes. The man who is watching 47's escape laughs to himself. I know that we've just started, but we should take a moment to look at the backstory of 47 and exactly how he ended up in that padded cell. Let's go back to 1962. A former youth correctional facility or a young offenders institute in Romania near Brasov is taken over by a Soviet research initiative named the Institute for Human Betterment. Essentially, it's a mental institution. The person in charge of this initiative was a man named Otto Wolfgang Ortmeier, a German scientist who actually served in the French Foreign Legion in the 1950s. It was around this time that Ortmeier developed an obsession with genetics, or more specifically, manipulating genetics. This came after he discovered the limitations and potential subordination of the average soldier. But back to 1962. The basement of this Institute for Human Betterment contained something very dark and sinister. It was essentially a human cloning program along with genetic experimentation. And on the 5th of September of the year 1964, Clone 47 is successfully cloned. He has a barcode tattooed on the back of his head, but the numbers do have some significance. 640509 is the date of his birth or creation. 04 refers to him being the part of the fourth series of clones and 01 means he is the first clone of that particular series, and 47 means that he is the 47th of Dr. Ortmeier's clones. 47 was regularly injected, and this caused him to lash out at the doctors at the asylum. 47 is trained in the art of assassination, trained in using firearms, trained in martial arts, the use of disguise and blending in, and 47 developed a heightened sense of awareness. In the comic series titled Birth of the Hitman, 47 formed a close friendship with a fellow clone named Six, and the two of them grew so close that they were sent out on assassination missions together. In 1973 though, discontentment was brewing in Six. He convinced 47 to escape from the asylum with him, and they arrived in a small farming village. But the following morning they worked to the sound of gunfire, and everyone in the village had been killed on the orders of Dr. Ortmeier. 47 and 6 were recaptured and returned to the Institute. Fast forward to 1989 and the pair attempt to escape again. This time they were on an assignment in Berlin. 
They convinced a German scientist who designed the explosive chip implants inside them to deactivate said implants. 47 killed the scientist and they returned to the asylum and attempted to free the other clones. This failed and 6 and 47 were trapped in a cafeteria. 47 offered to stay at the asylum allowing 6 to escape and 6 was then considered dead. For 47 it didn't end well. In order to prevent another uprising, 47's memory was completely wiped with an experimental serum, including all his memory of 6. He did however retain the knowledge of his training so he didn't lose any of his skills. This serum was also later administered to all the other clones in the facility too. A lot of clones reacted badly to the serum and a lot died as a result, however 47 was absolutely fine. Those others that did survive eventually became too weak to carry out assassinations. 47 ended up as the only clone there at the asylum who could carry out what he was created for, to kill. This leads us into the events of Codename 47 and 47's final escape from the asylum. He escaped rather easily and there is a reason for that which we'll get to soon. So now we have some backstory and we know that 47's memory had been wiped, we have some context behind what's going to happen next. Since the year 1998 up to his escape from the asylum, an organisation called the International Contract Agency or the ICA had taken an interest in 47's skills as well as his activities. In the birth of the Hitman novel, 47 is sent on a contract by an unknown client to assassinate a man named Franklin Marchand, a developer of satellite technology. But on the side, Marchand had been producing chemical weapons in Afghanistan. Now this wouldn't have been such a big deal had it not been for a leak at one of the plants resulting in the death of 500 people in the area. 47's contract stated that Marshan had to die in a way that made it look like an accident, otherwise he'd become a martyr. One issue, another person had hired the ICA to deal with Marshan too and the ICA sent four people along to take out Marshan. 47 temporarily incapacitated the ICA team and killed Marshan making it look like an accident. After this, a lady working for the ICA named Diana Burnwood meets 47 in a bar and offers him the chance to audition for the ICA. We see 47 arriving at a top secret ICA facility where he meets with Diana again. He's put through various scenarios, psych evaluations and more interestingly has a background check done. The ICA's training director at the time, Eric Soders, comments that it's almost as if the earth just spat him out. Soders didn't trust 47 and believed he was lying about certain things regarding where he came from, which of course was the asylum. Soders and the ICA wanted to know as much about him as possible in order to use it against him should the situation arise. Diana did give 47 some help in passing his auditions and then not long after this, 47 was made an ICA agent, simply named Agent 47, and Diana was assigned as his handler. It didn't take long until Agent 47 received his first contract. It's time to go to Hong Kong. 47's first contract with the ICA was to take out a triad gang leader named Li Hong. The problem is that Hong was so well protected by the police, thanks to the corrupt chief of police, and if 47 attempts to get close to him straight away, he would almost certainly end up dead. Li Hong belongs to the Red Dragon Triad, another triad gang in Hong Kong, named the Blue Lotus Triad exist, and 47 needs to instigate a gang war between the two gangs. To start with, 47 takes out a Red Dragon negotiator. Shortly after this, the Blue Lotus Triad become terrified that Li Hong is going to blame them for the death of his negotiator. Not wanting a war, the Blue Lotus Triad send an emissary to Li Hong's restaurant to apologise. The plan is to kill the emissary and his bodyguards, making it look like a counter-attack from Li Hong. The hit goes well with 47 taking out his targets, but more is to be done. The last hit has triggered a war between the triads. The corrupt chief steps in and is meeting representatives from both sides in the hope of brokering a peace deal. Agent 47 steals a disguise belonging to the Red Dragon negotiator, places a Red Dragon amulet on the table in the restaurant and craftily takes out the chief of police. This leads to the police withdrawing their protection of Li Hong. Still with a sizeable army protecting him though, taking out Li Hong will still prove to be a challenge. 47 infiltrates Li Hong's restaurant, also his headquarters, and meets a prostitute named Lei Ling. After helping her escape, she mentions that there is a CIA agent being held down in the basement by the Red Dragon Triad. She gives 47 the code to Li Hong's safe as he needs an amulet from it. 47 frees the CIA agent and Agent Carlton Smith, and Smith tells 47 the location of the safe, and he escapes. 
47 gets to the safe and grabs the amulet. He gives the amulet to a vendor in the restaurant who gives 47 some poison. 47 gets a waiter's uniform and poisons Li Hong's soup. Taking it to Li Hong though, his massive bodyguard soon tastes it and, well, he gets poisoned. Li Hong runs off and 47 is grabbed by Sun, but shoots him. He takes an elevator to Li Hong's location and kills him. He takes a rather cryptic letter from his body from a man named France. Next up, 47 needs to head on a contract to the jungle in Colombia. Another mysterious person has asked the ICA to take out a drug lord named Pablo Ochoa. Ochoa has a drug empire and has built it in the jungle. The problem is that it's spilling onto land that belongs to the local Uwa tribe. 47 uses this to his advantage. One of Ochoa's planes had crashed whilst drug smuggling and has ordered his men to retrieve a golden idol from the wreckage. 47 gets there first, frees the brother of the tribe leader who is being held captive and gives the idol back to the tribe. As a reward for his loyalty to them, they tell 47 of a secret passage to Ochoa's base. But they do warn him about encountering a sacred god they call Tezcatlipoca, a god of death. Well, this turns out to just be a jaguar. Nonetheless, 47 finds the entrance and crawls through. He infiltrates Ochoa's base and finding him role-playing as Tony Montana, 47 takes him out, takes a bomb, plants it in the drug lab, blows it up, and uses Ochoa's personal plane to escape the jungle. But another day, another contract. This time, 47 is tasked with assassinating a man named Franz Fuchs, an Austrian terrorist. He's planning to blow up a hotel called the Hotel Gallard in Budapest. The reason was that many world leaders were meeting there for a peace summit. 47 kills Fuchs, and on his desk are two letters. Remember the letter 47 found on Li Hong? Two letters on Franz's desk are from Li Hong and Pablo Ochoa. They were both labeled blood and muscle. These targets are all connected somehow. Nonetheless, 47 recovers the bomb and escapes the hotel. Next up, he's sent on a contract to Rotterdam, where he is sent to track down and assassinate an arms dealer named Arkadis Jegorov. He's also known as Boris, so we'll just refer to him as that. Diana also informs 47 before he sets off that their suspicions about these targets all being connected were involved in the French Foreign Legion in some way. Anyway, on the assignment, 47 needs to first find Boris, as he's not an easy man to track down. He plants a tracker on a local gang's car. This gang are buying weapons from an arms dealer named Ivan, who is working closely with Boris. 47 follows the car to their hideout and places the tracker from the car into the briefcase of money. Ivan turns up and takes the payment and the tracker, and it leads 47 to a large ship on which Boris was preparing a nuke. Agent 47 plants a bomb in his car in the event that Boris tries to escape. Agent 47 boards the ship under disguise and finds that the bomb was armed and ready to be detonated. After killing Boris, whichever way he sees fit, 47 disarms the bomb and takes the ship out to international waters, later being picked up by the ICA. After this, the ICA's suspicions were further confirmed when they found out that all four previous contracts were ordered by the same person. Even though this was against regulations, the ICA recognized the power that the client had and authorized one final contract from this client. Their target was a Dr. Kovacs, a doctor working in a Romanian hospital. Using the alias Tobias Reaper, 47 goes up to meet with Dr. Kovacs. Then this happens. Hello and welcome to you, Mr. Reaper. How may I assist you? That depends. Are you the only Dr. Kovacs here? Yes, I am. Hey, I recognize you. You were the one with a needle. It wasn't me. I was hardly involved in the experiments. It was Professor Ortmeier who was in charge. Yes, yes, he's the one to blame, not me. Yep, Kovacs was the one who subjected 47 to all those traumatic injections when he was younger. Kovacs blames it on Ortmeier, but 47 kills him. SWAT teams have arrived at the hospital after being called by the receptionist. They are there to take 47 out. Taking Kovacs' disguise, 47 finds Agent Smith again drugged out of his mind, and after administering an antidote, Smith leads 47 to an underground lab, a place where 47 will find answers. 47 realizes that the basement he woke up in a year earlier was a lab for human cloning experiments. He then hears a familiar voice, the man who had helped him escape the asylum the previous year. So if you haven't put it together yet, it's revealed that all of the hits came from one man, Dr. Ortmeier. We've already discovered that Clone 47 was made from DNA and was genetically enhanced to be a killing machine. 
but he was made from the DNA of five people. Li Hong, Pablo Ochoa, Franz Fuchs, Oris, and Ortmeier himself. So he essentially has five dads. Remember how easy the escape was? Ortmeier was the man talking to 47 at the start, and he helped 47 escape because his associates, who were funding his research, got tired of waiting and due to all the setbacks, they wanted Ortmeier to hand 47 over to them so they could use him for their own agenda, which is what their letters referred to. Ortmeier though has actually created a load of Agent 48 clones more powerful than 47. The final contract was a trap and Ortmeier figured he must kill 47. But with Agent 47 being very good at what he does, he kills all the 48 clones. In a final confrontation with Ortmeier, he kills him. You have proved to be my favorite son. I am so proud of you. <laughs> you... Oh, I should have known. Uh, uh, I didn't even recognize my own son. You, you broke my heart, my son. What good is a bullet proof vest when death strikes from within? And then in the game Hitman Contract, we get a view into how 47 escaped from the asylum after killing Dr. Ortmeier. He took a car and drove right through the front gates. Then that brings this chapter of 47's journey to an end. Two men speak on a cargo ship. They are talking about Boris, the weapons dealer that 47 killed in Rotterdam. One of the men, Boris's half-brother Sergei, and a mystery man talk about the cloning program and its goal of augmenting and improving the human species. The mystery man says he knows the location of the asylum in Romania. The two arrive there and see CCTV footage of 47 taking out SWAT members and escaping. The mystery man states that this is the work of Mr. 47, to which Sergei replies that 47 is just a rumour. Seems this mystery man actually saw 47 in Rotterdam during his mission to take out Boris. Sergei asks if 47 is for hire, but the other man says that 47 has gone quiet and for all he knows, 47 could even be dead. Then they set out to go and find him. This leads us into Hitman 2, Silent Assassin. It seems that after two years, 47 has got tired of life as a hitman for hire and has left the ICA and retired. In 2002, he moved to Sicily and became a man of faith, living and working at a church run by Father Emilio Vittorio, and the two become great friends. 47 would tend to the gardens on the church grounds. He wants to confess his past to Father Vittorio and 47 goes to confession and tells the priest about his past. Not long after this confession, Father Vittorio is approached outside the church by two people in a car. One of the men gets out, punches Father Vittorio in the face and they kidnap him, leaving a hefty ransom of half a million dollars. Knowing he doesn't have that money, 47 reaches out to the ICA and agrees to carry out an assassination contract in exchange for any information pertaining to the possible whereabouts of Father Vittorio. He was taken by a local mobster named Giuseppe Giuliani, a capo for one of the largest and most influential mafia families in Sicily. Giuseppe is holed up at a nearby villa, the Villa Borghese. The ICA want 47 to take out a couple of mafia members for them, and they have intelligence that Father Vittorio is being held in the villa's basement. He needs to take out Don Giuliani. He does so, but Father Vittorio is not there. The agency later confirms to 47 that they saw on satellite four Russian men dragging him away, and then they lost him at an airport. 47's work isn't finished though, he still needs to repay his debt to the ICA, and he takes a contract that was put out on an ex-KGB general, General Rumyantsev. He'll be meeting with other generals at the Zaitsev building in St. Petersburg. After identifying the general, 47 takes him out. In the aftermath, the generals start to investigate the reason behind the murder of Rumyantsev. The ICA have naturally missed the skill set of Agent 47, and they want him back. They state that although his debt has been paid, their client really needs the contract taken care of. 47 replies that he doesn't really care about their client, but nonetheless, he agrees to go on another assassination. This time, he's tasked with taking out another of the generals, a man named General Makarov. Makarov is terrified that someone is coming for him next, 
So he's trying to get some protection from a mafia contact of his, a man named Igor Cabasco. They have agreed to meet at the Kirov Park in St. Petersburg, and 47 manages to take the both of them out, escaping via boat. But the assignment just got tougher. The next target, General Mikhail Bardachenko, needs snuffing out, but he's in a secret bunker underground. 47 infiltrates, kills Bardachenko and frees a prisoner. Yep, Agent Smith has got himself into yet more bother. Three generals down, one to go. Finally, 47 is sent to the German embassy, where he is to take out General Vladimir Zubikov. Not only that, 47 is to retrieve a briefcase which contains a missile guidance system. The general is planning to sell it to the highest bidder in the West. The Russians weren't happy about one of their generals potentially defecting to a NATO country, so they sent an agent from the Spetsnaz to retrieve the briefcase too. 47 kills the general and retrieves the briefcase. With 47 now out of retirement, he sent on a mission to eliminate a Japanese arms dealer named Masahiro Hayamoto. He's got an important missile guidance system, but the ICA don't actually know where he is. Not a problem though, Hayamoto Jr. is hanging out at a remote location. 47 goes to the location and places a tracker inside Hayamoto Jr. by way of poisoned fish, eliminating him using the poisoned fish with the tracker inside the fish. With Hayamoto Jr. dead, his body with the tracker inside was taken to Hayamoto Sr. to his castle, Katsuyama Joe. Of course he has a castle. Hayamoto has been in hiding for 15 years, so this is an opportunity the ICA cannot miss. The place is well hidden and extremely well guarded. But this means nothing to Agent 47 though, and he infiltrates the castle. During his voyage through the castle, 47 meets a familiar face. Lei Ling, who he first met and helped escape from Hong Kong. I'm so glad to see you again. You are my number one. Still living a lousy life, I see. 47 kills Hayamoto Sr. and takes the missile guidance system, escaping by helicopter. His next mission takes him to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where he is set to take out a hacker named Charlie Sijan, who has stolen an extremely valuable piece of military software from the US government. 47 enters the basement where Charlie is working and assassinates him, but he discovers that the man he assassinated wasn't Charlie. It was Charlie's twin brother. Charlie himself is actually in his jacuzzi in one of the suites. 47 needs to place a hacking device on one of the computer terminals so that the client can retrieve the software. He does this, but the client discovers that the software codes have already been passed on. They've been passed on to an Indian cult called the Gudwara. The client says that they are one of their own customers, and he is furious that his customer stole something from right under his nose. 47 still has to eliminate Charlie though, so he goes to his penthouse suite and takes him out. It needs to look like a burglary gone wrong, so after stealing some valuables, 47 escapes. Next up, a contract in Afghanistan. He is sent in to retrieve some cargo which was stolen from their client by Afghan rebels, or more specifically the Nuristan rebels. He needs to eliminate Lieutenant Ahmed Zahir, obtain a map with the location of the cargo, which is some warheads, eliminate Colonel Mohammed Amin, and get a key from him. 47, after completing this mission, is to kill the local Khan. He's trying to sell the client's cargo to the United Nations, who will be arriving to check out the goods. 47 takes out the Khan and escapes the area, but he still needs to retrieve the cargo for the client. It's in an underground base. After taking out his target, Yusuf Hussein, 47 secures the cargo and it's loaded onto a helicopter. The agency then contact 47, and Diana tells him that they're still trying to find Vittorio. Agent 47 then comes to the realization that Father Vittorio is probably dead and decides to carry on working for the ICA. He raises his fee by 50% and requests that they stop looking for Vittorio. 47 needs to go and meet with the agency's contact. He knows a way into the Gudwara's sacred temple. The cargo retrieved from Afghanistan cannot seem to find its way into the hands of the client. It's been stolen again, this time by the Gudwara, who stole the chopper that it was scheduled to pick it up. 47 meets with the contact, it's Agent Smith again. He tells 47 that there are three assassins hunting him and 47 needs to take them out. Not only that, but the cult's leader, Diwana G, has tightened security due to rumors of an attempt on his life. In order to ensure Smith's safety, 47 takes out all the assassins. He finds a secret passage which leads to an island and 47 reaches it via boat. He takes out Diwana G's personal physician, Hannah Law von Kamprad, and then moves on to a hospital island. 
G was set to undergo heart surgery and 47 impersonating a surgeon, managed to get past security and perform an operation, killing Diwana G. However, on escaping the island, 47 is attacked by someone who looks remarkably like himself. 47 can give chase but will get blown up, so in the case of this story, he escapes the island. The ICA then find out shortly after that all of 47's previous contracts were ordered by one man, Sergei Zavarotko, the brother of Boris. Sergei had set up all the contracts in order to obtain components for a nuclear bomb, and then he'd sell that to the Indian cultists. His plan hit a snag though when the cultists betrayed him. The UN then contact the ICA. They want Sergei dead, so 47 needs to return to St. Petersburg. 47 arrives to take down Sergei, but he's not there. A cardboard cutout is. 47 instead encounters and kills Agent 17, the clone he encountered on the hospital island. This was a setup by Sergei, the mystery man, and Agent 17. 17? You have a problem? Report back. 17? Did you take the bait? What is it? 17? Are you there? Where are you? Far away. Why? What do you need to know? Sergei, 17 is gone. This is 47. 47? But, uh... You had your chance, Sergei. Now get off my back, or I'll slit your throat. There must be some misunderstanding. Both me and my friend Vittorio think so. You got Vittorio? Let's just say he's here for, uh, spiritual guidance. Sergei, you keep Vittorio out of this. Understand? Staging his own assassination. Double-crossing creep. 47 goes back to Sicily to the church. But Sergei is there. His men are everywhere. But they're no match for 47, and after gunning them all down, he kills Sergei and saves Father Vittorio. At the end of the game, Father Vittorio pleaded with 47 to follow a good path in life, but 47 left the church and continued his career as a hitman. Okay, so we're skipping contracts for now, but there is a good reason for it, as contracts technically takes place in the middle of blood money, but let's continue. Fast forward two more years to 2004. Agent 47 has been sent on an assignment by the ICA to take out a man named Joseph Clarence. Also known as the Swing King, Clarence ran a very popular amusement park. That was until 2002, when an accident which was due to a ferris wheel malfunctioning resulted in a lot of injuries and deaths. Clarence went bankrupt due to the lawsuits, his marriage fell apart and the park closed, and eventually became run down and decrepit. Desperate for money, Clarence allowed a gangster called Scoop to use the grounds to make and sell drugs on the assumption that Scoop would cut Clarence in on some of the profits. But Scoop refused to pay Clarence a penny. One of the people who had died at the park had a family member who wouldn't let it go, and that person contacted the ICA as they wanted Clarence taken care of. 47 takes out Scoop and all of his gang members and he takes out Clarence too. Not long after this hit, 47 is sent out on another, this time to take out a man named Don Fernando Delgado and his son Manuel. Don Fernando was a wine producer in Chile, but he was also heavily involved in the illegal drug trade. Their particular cartel was previously involved in a large drug war with Pablo Ochoa's cartel, the man 47 killed back in Colombia, which explains why Don Fernando decided to move the drug operation to his vineyard. Anyway, 47 takes out father and son and escapes. Following month, Agent 47 is sent to Paris to assassinate a famous tenor named Alvaro Delvade and his friend, the American ambassador to the Vatican, Richard Delahunt. Delvade and Delahunt were actually the architects of a prostitution and trafficking ring, trafficking young boys and girls around Eastern Europe. Delvade was starring in a play called Tosca, and Delahunt was going to be present at the rehearsal. One particular scene was Delvade's character being executed. 47 infiltrates the theatre and retrieves a World War I replica gun from his jacket pocket. He then sneaks to Delvade's co-star's room and switches the prop gun with the real one. He then climbs the rig and watches Delvade get executed. Delahunt, realising there's something wrong, runs to investigate and 47 shoots a chandelier and it lands on Delahunt, killing him. 47 then escapes the theatre. Okay, so this is where the main storyline for Hitman Contracts comes in. It's not really a long plot. The majority of the game is made up of flashbacks to previous missions that 47 has been sent on. 
Some of these are just missions from Codename 47. Anyway, after leaving the theatre in Paris, 47 is being watched by a police officer. 47 ends up getting shot and wounded. 47 managed to get back to his apartment and he collapsed. He started to have flashbacks to his previous missions. These included escaping from the asylum after killing Ortmeier, a mission in a slaughterhouse where he had to take out some fat dude who called himself the Meat King, along with his lawyer, a mission in Siberia where he had to take out Fabian Fuchs, the brother of Franz Fuchs, one of 47's five fathers, a hit in England where he took out a couple of rich toffs along with saving a man held captive by them, and he also had flashbacks to missions where he infiltrated a biker gang to kill their leader and retrieve some sensitive photographs. And then he also remembered his missions in taking out Boris and also the hit on Lee Hong in Hong Kong. During these flashbacks, 47 was saved by a doctor that the ICA had sent. The doctor had to leave at some point though as the police had surrounded the building. The doctor gave 47 a serum and 47 started to come round. The SWAT team led by Inspector Albert Fournier entered the apartment complex and 47 had to escape. But before he did, he took out Fournier. After leaving Paris, 47 is on a plane heading back to the US and he speaks with Diana. She says that the ICA is losing friends at the FBI, CIA, MI5, Scotland Yard, and she suspects that something is going on at the highest level. 47 says that he'll lay low for a couple of months, but if it's not sorted out by then, then he'll just find a new employer. Diana responds, saying the only reason they are all squeezing the ICA is to get at 47. Diana hands 47 a file, saying she knows where the pressure is coming from an organization called The Franchise, but more on them later. 47, now back in the US, starts to receive lots of offers and contracts, such as his reputation as an efficient hitman. In April of 2004, 47 gets back into the thick of it by infiltrating a rehabilitation center. He meets up with an undercover agent, you guessed it, Agent Smith, who informs 47 of the identity of his target. 47 needs to help Smith escape, but seeing as the rehab center only releases patients from their care through sobriety or death, 47 uses an experimental drug which causes the patient to appear dead, only to be revived with an antidote later on. This helped 47 revive Smith and the pair escape after 47 took out his targets. A month later, 47 is tasked with taking out a gangster in witness protection called Vinny Sinistra. 47 needed to retrieve a highly sensitive piece of evidence, which according to the client cannot be allowed to see the light of day. 47 would now come face to face with one of the creations of the franchise, one of two elite albino assassins. The clone in question is called Mark Pariah Jr. He is part of a small group of assassins called the Crows. Two other members, couple Raymond Kalinsky and Angela Mason, along with Pariah Jr., are planning to assassinate the Secretary of the Interior, Jimmy Silly, because of his plan to re-elect the US President, Tom Stewart. 47 does what he does best and kills them, whilst ensuring the safety of the Secretary. Months later, sleigh bells are ringing, and 47 needs to assassinate a Senator's son, Chad Bingham Jr., along with an adult entertainment mogul called Lorne de Havilland. Lorne has a pretty spicy video of Chad murdering a prostitute. The order itself came from Senator Bingham's own campaign team. Whilst avoiding a franchise assassin, 47 takes out both targets and retrieves the evidence. Two contracts up next, same client but in Mississippi. 47 boards a ship and kills members of a drug trading gang along with their leader Skip Muldoon. 47 then retrieves some more sensitive photos from Skip's safe. He then crashes a wedding and kills the groom, who is Skip's son Buddy, along with Buddy's new father-in-law John LeBlanc, whilst ensuring that the bride, Margot LeBlanc, who is actually Buddy's cousin, survives. It's possible that Margot was actually the client who ordered the hit. This is due to the fact that she doesn't want to marry Buddy at all. She later sold all her family's assets and moved somewhere else. Heading to Vegas next, 47 arrives at the Shamal Hotel. He's there to fulfill a contract hit on Sheikh Mohammed bin Faisal Al Khalifa, who is the CEO of an Arabian pharmaceutical exporter. He is there to buy lab reports and DNA from a South African white supremacist called Hendrik Schmutz. The Sheikh has a scientist working for him called Tariq Abdul Latif. Anyway, the shady deal would never go down as 47 killed them all. But now, around this time, the franchise were taking out all of the ICA's agents until all that remained were Diana and 47. Diana chooses to close down the ICA, but they decide it's time for one last contract. They need to take out the assassins who killed their agents. Still in Vegas, 47 goes to a heaven and hell party. At the heaven party, 47 takes out a corrupt CIA operative named Anthony Martinez, 
who has been selling weapons to his girlfriend Vanna Ketlin, an arms dealer, and after descending to the Hell Party, he takes out the franchise's assassin named Eve. Shortly after this, in September 2005, Agent 47 is contacted by Agent Smith. He offers 47 a mission to prevent the assassination of the President of the United States, Tom Stewart. Remember I mentioned the Albino clones, that there were two of them? Well, the second of the two clones, Mark Parchese III, is the assassin, and 47 needs to take him out, along with the Vice President, Daniel Morris. The Vice President is a dodgy character. He's been working for an organization called Alpha Xerox. This is the company responsible for the franchise's cloning program. They want the president killed so that Daniel Morris can be installed as president so that he can ban cloning programs, giving the franchise the monopoly on creating clones. Alpha Xerox had already had the previous vice president assassinated in a car crash, elevating Morris to the position of vice president not long before this. A lot of people in the Hitman community, although it's not confirmed, believe the mystery man from Silent Assassin to be that of Daniel Morris. Anyway, 47 infiltrates the White House and takes out the vice president. All hell breaks loose, but eventually 47 kills Parchese on the roof of the West Wing. The heat is on after this hit, and 47 goes to his hideout as he's being hunted by the police and also franchise agents. Diana turns up unannounced, and this makes 47 very wary. She hands him a briefing, but it's a trap. Diana injects 47 with poison. Diana is then inducted into the franchise as one of their agents by their leader, Alexander Leland Kane. Meet Alexander Leland Kane, leader of the franchise. Not much is actually known about Kane prior to the game's events, but he was a successful businessman. A work accident resulting in paralysis and burns to his face left him wheelchair bound and he was convinced that this accident was actually an assassination attempt and because of this, Kane developed an obsession with assassins. He joined the CIA and went on to lead an operation as director of the FBI to try and take out Agent 47. He considered cloning projects a weapon of mass destruction of sorts, but he had an ulterior motive. Being the secret leader of the franchise, Kane wanted to destroy the ICA as he himself had his own cloning program. But seeing as his cloning program wasn't very good, he needed DNA samples from 47 to start making his clones more powerful. Throughout Blood Money, Kane is manipulating things, pulling strings. Kane's entire goal was to have cloning banned and to install a president as his puppet, and as we've discussed, Daniel Morris was that man. Kane used the corruption in Albert Fournier in order to try and get to 47. The police officer who shot 47 in Paris was actually Mark Parchese III in disguise. He ordered hits on the Secretary of the Interior, he ordered his clones to start assassinating the ICA's agents and operatives, putting them out of business. He ordered the hit on President Stewart. His turning point would come when he'd learned of 47's whereabouts, and he convinces Diana to betray 47 and deliver him to Kane. If she did this, she would be spared by Kane. Now, at the start of this game and throughout it, broken up into sections, we see that Kane invited a reporter to his mansion, a reporter named Rick Henderson. Kane's aim was to lie to the reporter, blaming 47 for everything that happened. He told Henderson that 47 was responsible for the hits on the Delgados, Dalvade, and Della Hunt, but this is where Kane started to twist the truth a little bit. When it came to details of the Vinny Sinistra job, Kane tells the reporter that 47 killed Vinny because he had evidence of Dr. Ortmeier's cloning program and all the data on it. He made a lie that 47 killed Vinny and sold that data to the highest bidder. He said that the Mardi Gras attempt on the secretary's life was orchestrated by 47 and that Pariah, the albino assassin clone, was actually an associate of 47, when in reality 47 saved the secretary. After giving him this massive scoop, Kane takes Henderson to see proof of everything he said, 47's body lying in the church, ready for cremation. Kane painted the death of 47 as a complete accident, almost in a way to humiliate the world's most dangerous assassin by framing his death as an accident. Diana walks into the church and places 47's signature silver ball of pistols on his chest. She kisses him, but unbeknownst to everyone else, she has an antidote on her lips. It's clear that Diana had a plan and killed 47 to save both of their lives, then probably one of the coolest moments I've experienced in gaming. 47 then causes an absolute bloodbath at the church and murders everyone, including Kane. Sometime after this, Diana, who had likely dismantled the franchise from the inside, reopened the ICA using the resources from the franchise in order to do so. Diana takes a call and explains that they lost track of 47. Meanwhile, 47 walks into a building and asks to access a service that is 
in the back. This chapter of Hitman comes to a close. We now move on to the Hitman novel titled Hitman Damnation. This book gives us some context behind and is a prequel to the next game in the series, Hitman Absolution. Around six years since the events of Blood Money in 2011, 47 is sent to Nepal and is to assassinate a Chinese general named Nam Vo. His soldiers have been committing unspeakable acts against the Tibetan villagers. 47 is all set with his plans to carry out the hit, but his contact with Diana is abruptly ended and this makes 47 suspicious. It turns out that Diana is planning on abandoning the ICA and was destroying agency financial accounts. ICA operatives had descended on her hotel room and she had to leave quickly. Anyway, despite 47 killing his target, 47 gets hurt in his attempt, but is taken care of by a local couple. Problem is that 47 is addicted to painkillers now after 14 weeks of constant back pain. He abandons his attempt to check in with the ICA and he just lets them think that he died in the assassination of Nam Vo. No longer tied to the ICA, 47 goes freelance. He carries out small time hits from gangsters on various other gangsters, but at some point, 47 takes a trip to Rio de Janeiro on a private jet, a treat from one of his clients called Roger. But the pilot ditches the plane in midair and it crashes into the sea. 47 is floating in the ocean for a good few hours until he passes out and wakes up on an ICA yacht. An ICA operative, Jade Nguyen, says that Roger was actually working for them and helped them locate 47. 47 learns that an ICA division chief, a man named Benjamin Travis, is his new handler, having replaced Diana. 47 eventually agrees to rejoin the ICA again. Throughout the book, we see 47 carry out more assassinations on senators and criminals. We also see a man named Birdie, an agency informant. I'm not going to explain this book in full, as the plot in it is quite complex with lots of moving parts, and I'm just using the book to get some context behind what happens in Absolution. Agent 47 carries out a hit on a shady pastor called Charlie Wilkins, but the hit resulted in riots, riots which produced 193 fatalities and 758 injuries. Due to the heat generated from this, 47 would go to Guadalajara to lay low. Diana, on the other hand, has abandoned the ICA and is now renting a mansion in Chicago. But why does she abandon the ICA? So not only did Diana abandon the ICA, she full on betrayed them. She sabotaged their funding and their entire database. What's more, she disclosed the ICA's very existence to the public. She then used this pandemonium inside the ICA to flee and disappear. The ICA built themselves back up though and Benjamin Travis finds Diana in Chicago. Diana has been authorized for assassination and guess who gets the contract? Agent 47. 47 doesn't just have to take out Diana, he has to retrieve a teenage girl called Victoria who is being kept by Diana in her Chicago mansion. 47 assumes the identity of the driver of an ice cream truck, takes out the guard and sneaks around the compound entering the house. He sneaks up to Diana's room and shoots her while she's coming out of the shower. 47 wants to know why she betrayed the ICA. She tells 47 that she uncovered a plan by Benjamin Travis, a plan that genetically engineered Victoria into a super assassin much like 47 was by Ortmeier. That's why she betrayed the agency and took Victoria from them, to prevent her from living a life similar to that of 47's. She asks 47 to protect Victoria and he agrees to do so. Diana gives 47 a letter and he cuts his line to Travis and goes dark. Naturally, Travis assumes 47 to be a traitor too and puts every available ICA agent onto searching for him and Victoria. 47 takes Victoria to the Rosewood Orphanage in order for a nun named Sister Mary to look after her. 47 needs to know who is after Victoria and he seeks that information from the ICA informant Birdie. Birdie needs a favour though. 47 needs to assassinate a Chinatown crime lord who goes by the name of King. After King is dealt with, Birdie wants something else, so 47 reluctantly hands over his beloved silver ball of pistols. Birdie tells 47 that a man named Blake Dexter, owner and founder of Dexter Industries, wants Victoria. He's staying on the top floor of the Terminus Hotel, so 47 heads there. 47 snuck into the Terminus Hotel and overhears a conversation where it's revealed that Dexter's plan was to kidnap Victoria and sell her to the highest bidder. 47 spots Dexter's massive bodyguard Sanchez and tries to take him out, but Sanchez easily overpowers 47. Dexter recognizes 47 and shoots a maid working at the hotel in an attempt to frame 47, sets fire to the room and leaves. 47 comes to though and finds himself being hunted by the Chicago police force. 
Using his cunning and guile, 47 escapes the hotel and after a tense moment moving through a train station, he blends in with the crowd and leaves on a train. 47 goes to see Birdie again, who this time tells 47 that Dexter had an informant in Chicago. This informant owns a strip club called the Vixen Club in Chicago. This man's called Dominic Osmond and he's believed to be the man who has been giving Dexter information about Victoria. 47 takes out Osmond however he sees fit and later after going to Osmond's office he finds out via a recording of a phone call that Dexter had hired a mercenary named Edward Wade along with his mercenary group in order to find Birdie. Birdie also knew the location of Victoria. But Birdie of course needs 47 to help him out of the sticky situation he's found himself in and 47 heads to meet with Birdie at his Chinatown hideout, but he's not there. A homeless man tells 47 that Wade and his men have already got to Birdie, have captured him and were headed downtown. 47 uses Birdie's mobile hideout to drive to the Rosewood Orphanage as due to the capture of Birdie, it's very likely that Wade now knows the location of Victoria. What he doesn't know though is that Birdie hasn't been captured at all. He betrayed 47 in exchange for his own life. Nonetheless, he's given away the location of Victoria. 47 arrives at the orphanage just in time. Well, just before Wade and his mercenaries attack the orphanage. Luckily, the orphanage is pretty much empty. All the children have gone on a field trip. All that remains in the orphanage are the staff and the nuns. 47 reaches Victoria and Sister Mary. Sister Mary says that Victoria has quite mysteriously become ill. The doctors don't know what's wrong with her at all. But it turns out the necklace is the key to not only Victoria's abilities, but also her health in general. This is the moment Wade and his goons attack the orphanage, and Sister Mary tells 47 that the safest place for Victoria is in the basement. 47 tells her that he'll meet her there. After some shenanigans with the elevator's power, it seems that Victoria has been taken by Wade. 47 gets down to the basement, but in the meantime, Dexter's son Lenny, who has been tagging along with Wade's group, shoots and kills Sister Mary. 47 makes his way through the basement, and after hunting Wade, 47 wounds him. As Wade lies there dying, Lenny has Victoria hostage and is holding a hand grenade forcing 47 to refrain from shooting him. 47 searches Wade for a clue as to where Lenny might be taking Victoria and he finds a matchbook for a bar called Balls of Fire in the town of Hope, South Dakota. 47 leaves Wade to die and takes his car, setting off on the long drive. Around 10 hours later, 47 arrives in Hope. Dexter effectively runs the town and all the cops and the sheriff, Sheriff Skirky, are on his payroll. Meanwhile, Dexter and his humongous bodyguard Sanchez meet with Birdie. Birdie tells Dexter that 47 killed his friend Dominic Osmond, and Birdie offers Dexter his services. Dexter tells Birdie that he doesn't need him, as he already has Victoria. Sanchez is about to dispose of Birdie, and Dexter mentions the name Jade. He's of course referring to Benjamin Travis' assistant. Birdie mentions to Dexter that she is a low-level agency employee. Dexter then puts two and two together and realises that Victoria is connected to the ICA. Due to Dexter now realising just how much Victoria is worth, he lets Birdie live. 47 arrives at the bar and after using a bar brawl as cover, instigated rather bizarrely by Adam Kane Marcus, 47 learns of Lenny's location from a bartender. 47, who still isn't aware of Birdie's betrayal, makes contact with Birdie, who tells 47 that he's left his silver baller pistols at a gun shop in Hope. Meanwhile, on an ICA yacht in Morocco, Jade approaches Travis and shows him something. It's from Birdie. He's offering up 47's location in exchange for a payout from the ICA. Travis, desperate to catch his man, accepts and says that they need to find 47 at any cost. Arriving at McGarman's gun shop, 47 spots his pistols and has to win them back in a shooting competition against the town's best shooter, Lily McGarmond. Upon winning his pistols back, he reads a note from Birdie. It seems that he's playing both sides. He wants the cash from the ICA and for 47 to take care of Dexter. Back on the ICA yacht, it seems that Birdie's information checked out as they discover 47 is indeed in hope. Travis orders the ICA to track 47 down. And Travis tells Jade that it's time to send in the saints. It's time for 47 though to go after Lenny, who is hanging out with his gang. What Lenny didn't know though was that his gang were planning to steal Victoria from Dexter and sell her to one of Dexter's arms dealing rivals named Stallion Armaments. Their plan doesn't materialise as 47 manages to take out the gang members and drives Lenny into the desert and gets him to reveal where Victoria is. He gives up the information and after deciding whether to shoot Lenny or simply leave him to certain death, 47 needs to get to an underground cage fight being held at Dexter's weapons factory 
as Lenny had revealed that Dexter had left Victoria with his bodyguard Sanchez, who was himself due to fight. Dexter is then informed by a scientist, Dr. Ashford, that Victoria has an unusual biology, and that, as previously revealed, Victoria's abilities can only be activated by a certain necklace, with this necklace, or rather the isotope within it, rejuvenating her cells. Dexter finds out via his assistant that his son Lenny has been kidnapped. He's furious and tells his assistant to call the ICA and set up a ransom for Victoria. And to get Sheriff Skirky, who is receiving, well, some after-hour sentencing, to find Lenny. 47 infiltrates Dexter's factory and discovers Dexter's plan for Victoria. He takes out Dexter's scientists deleted all the research they had on her, 47 then enters the fight and then finds out that Sanchez had stashed Victoria at the courthouse with Sheriff Skirky and kills Sanchez. After a long, arduous day, 47 needs some R&R, &R, so he takes some rest at the Waikiki Motel. 47 is about to meet the Saints. They are a side project of Benjamin Travis, a group of elite female assassins who dress as, let's just say, nuns. Go with God, motherfucker. The hotel is attacked and the Saints, along with some ICA agents, attempt to track down 47. One by one he takes out each and every one of the Saints. 47 picks up a phone. On the other end, Benjamin Travis. 47 tells him that he's still alive and that the Saints failed. Travis is furious and he decides he needs to handle this himself, so he heads to Hope. 47's next destination is the courthouse. He manages to get into the jail underneath the courthouse, but is caught up and prepared by Sheriff Skirky. By prepared, I mean prepared for Dexter, who arrives to try and torture 47. He demands to know where his son is, but 47 just smiles. Dexter leaves, and 47, later left alone, escapes captivity. He retrieves his gear and escapes from the courthouse. Just as he is escaping, though, Travis arrives, and his ICA colleagues shoot Sheriff Skirky in the leg. Skirky retreats to a nearby church, being followed by 47, and after he takes the priest hostage in the middle of the funeral service, 47 incapacitates Skirky. Dying, Skirky tells 47 that Dexter was headed to an apartment building called Blackwater Park, all the way back in Chicago. 47 then takes the hearse and travels there. Dexter meets with Travis in his attempt to offload Victoria for the $10 million ransom fee, but Travis, being Travis, attempts to screw Dexter over. This backfires on Travis as Dexter appears to execute Victoria in front of him. It's not Victoria though, it's Skirky's favourite dominatrix. Dexter turns the table and is now demanding the 10 million or he'll kill Victoria for real. Dexter walks away and tells Travis that he'll contact him shortly with Victoria's whereabouts. After all that drama, 47 joins the party and arrives at Blackwater Park. The entire building is under security lockdown, even to residents of the apartments, so 47 has to infiltrate in order to ascend to the upper floors. He enters an elevator and, totally out of character, 47 alerts Dexter's security team by shooting out the camera in the elevator. Dexter's assistant Layla tells him that he should leave with Victoria and that she will stop 47 herself. The plan doesn't work as 47 finds Dexter's panic room. He hears Dexter on the phone. He reveals that he's getting Victoria onto a helicopter and that he's going to attempt to make more like her. Then Victoria showcases what makes her so special, displaying her abilities and becoming the very thing Diana was trying to save her from. 47 makes his way to the helipad and discovers that Dexter is rigging the building, or rather his penthouse suite, to be destroyed, and therefore he hopes he will deal with 47. He manages to reach Dexter before time runs out and saves Victoria. Dexter is dying and grieves his son. He cries out for his money, as that's what he really cares about, and a furious Victoria throws money at him. 47 and Victoria both leave. Remember that Diana gave 47 a letter before he killed her? Here's what it said. If you read this letter, I am most likely dead. You will have shot me for a traitor, and Travis will have won. Do not let him have the girl as well. Travis's division was conducting genetic experiments without the agency's knowledge, and Victoria was their crowning achievement. Give her the choice you never had. Protect Victoria, and kill Benjamin Travis. So 47 now needs to kill Travis, who, as you've just heard, has been carrying out secret side projects away from the watchful eye of his ICA bosses. 
He's in Cornwall, England, and he's having Diana's grave exhumed, as he doesn't believe that 47 killed Diana like he was supposed to. 47 kills Jade, along with a trio of Travis's dangerous bodyguards named the Praetorians. 47 then wounds Travis in an explosion and confronts him. Travis is furious that 47 has wasted Victoria's potential to be a top ICA assassin like him. Travis asks 47 if he killed Diana, tells Travis that he'll never know, and then he kills him. At the end of the game, it's revealed that Diana is very much alive and is caring for Victoria, who is herself contemplating getting rid of her necklace. 47 watches from a distance. Finally, a Chicago police detective named Cosmo Faulkner has been trying to find 47 ever since the Terminus Hotel incident, without results. But in walks Birdie, who offers up 47's location for a price. The game then ends. So we now move on to the World of Assassination trilogy. Seven years have passed since the events of Absolution, and 47 and Diana Burnwood are once again back in good favour with the ICA. The following day, 47 is sent on an assignment to Paris to take out Viktor Novikov, along with his girlfriend and business partner Dalia Margolis. Despite Novikov being a Russian oligarch and the owner of a fashion house called Sanguine, the business he runs with Margolis is a top secret intelligence agency called Iago. Iago, ever since 1954, operates auctions around the world, at which they sell highly classified information to the global elite. They weren't allied to any particular side, as that would be bad for business. They facilitated a nuclear reactor meltdown at an Odessa power plant led by Crimean separatists. Also, remember 47's mission in Chile, way back during Blood Money, in which he had to take out Fernando Delgado and his son Manuel? Well, it was Iago that provided the intelligence which allowed them to shoot down the plane of a South American president named President Hernandez. In this particular auction though, the coveted item up for grabs is a list containing very sensitive information that belongs to MI6. MI6 want this sorted, so they hire the ICA to deal with the matter. The list is a knock or non-official cover list, information on all of MI6's agents that are undercover operating in the Middle East. 47's job is to eliminate both Novikov and Margolis in order to prevent the list falling into the wrong hands. 47 enters the private event as a guest of the fashion show and whichever he chooses to do so, he successfully eliminates both Novikov and Margolis. 47's next assignment is the picturesque Italian village of Sapienza. The ICA has received a contract to locate and destroy a virus. The virus itself is specific to a certain individual's DNA and is untraceable. 47 has to not only destroy the virus, but it needs to take out the two doctors working on the virus too. These doctors work for the Ether Biotech Corporation. One of the targets, Silvio Caruso, used to be a client of the ICA, and 47 was actually contracted by him to assassinate a businessman in Sapienza by the name of Marco Abbiati. Also on the hit list in Sapienza is Caruso's assistant, Francesca DeSantis, who was actually herself sent there by Ether to spy on Caruso. Caruso knows this though and has a sample of DeSantis' DNA, or rather some of her hair, in his safe in the attic. Not only that, but Caruso also has a variant of the virus linked to DeSantis' DNA too, just in case. Anyway, 47 takes them out, enters the laboratory underneath Caruso's villa, destroys the virus and escapes. Next up, the ICA receive a contract from a building contracting firm named Hamilton Lowe. The targets marked for assassination are a Swedish banking CEO named Klaus Strandberg, who had been convicted on many counts of fraud after he stole billions from the population of Morocco through a Ponzi scheme. He was travelling in a convoy as a prisoner, but a group of heavily armed soldiers attacked the convoy, and in the drama, Strandberg fled and took refuge at the Swedish embassy in Marrakesh. This leads us to 47's next target an army general named Reza Zaydan. It's believed that General Zaydan purposely carried out the attack on the convoy so it would spark mass protests and civil unrest in the country. He had a motive to impose martial law and state a coup d'etat and overthrow Morocco's government. This client in particular, Hamilton Lowe, had interests inside the Moroccan government, so naturally, they don't want this coup to take place. Agent 47 goes to Marrakesh, gets to work, and assassinates both Strandberg and Zaydan. Next up, 47 travels to Bangkok, Thailand. He's arrived at the Club 47 Hotel to take out a famous rock star, Jordan Cross, along with the family lawyer. But what's the lawyer got to do with it? Well, one year prior, Jordan Cross had a party and threw his girlfriend, promising actress Hannah Highmore, off of his high-rise penthouse apartment. Young Jordan got acquitted because he has a rich dad named Thomas Cross, 
who hired a defense attorney named Ken Morgan who staged a cover-up. The girl's family, furious, took out a contract with the ICA and 47 went to the hotel. He succeeds in the mission, taking out the two targets with ruthless precision. One week after the contract in Bangkok, 47 meets with Diana at an airport. It seems that Thomas Cross, Jordan's father, who is a media mogul, a very powerful man, and a recluse, had emerged from his self-imposed exile to attend his son's funeral. At this funeral, Thomas Cross was kidnapped and later found dead. This was no coincidence. Not by a long shot. Thomas Cross had billions in hidden offshore accounts, all stripped clean within hours of the kidnapping. Someone wanted the son dead to lure out the father. Someone smart enough to stay in the shadows while we did the wet work and the high moors picked up the check. A shadow client. Someone got rich. The contract was just. That was a sound problem. I know you don't care about politics, 47. But ICA is neutral, or as has been. Can't allow ourselves to be manipulated. Besides... It's happened before. Italy. Morocco. Paris. All our clients got their intel the same way. Anonymous tips from a hidden source. Each contract perfectly legit, yet part of a grander design. I don't see the pattern. Somebody does. The board has asked us to chase down this shadow client, and our analysts are closing in as we speak. I know that tone. Someone's playing a game, 47. The question is... Against whom? In terms of Paris, the Shadow Client knew that Viktor Novikov was under investigation by the Russian FSB, namely an agent called Kamarov. Novikov ordered a hit, and the Shadow Client had staged it, so it looked self-inflicted. The Shadow Client then went to Paris in order to collect his reward, which was a list of all the names of the global elite. The Shadow Client then texted someone and told them to leak the names, the names being Novikov and Margolis. MI6 picked the names up, leading to the assassination of both Novikov and Margolis. In terms of Sapienza, the Shadow Client leaked information regarding the creation of a weaponized virus to one of the Ether Corporation's private shareholders, who then, in turn, requested a hit on Caruso and De Sanctis, and of course, requested the virus be destroyed on ethical grounds. A week after this happened, the Shadow Client followed a man named Heijun from Italy to Johannesburg, Heijun was sent to investigate the destruction of the virus by Ether. The Shadow Client asks for a key. Heijun hands it over and mentions the name Providence and that they will find the Shadow Client's weakness. The Shadow Client then executes Heijun. The Shadow Client was also the one who leaked information about a possible coup by General Zaydan in Marrakesh, leading to Hamilton Lowe taking out a contract with the ICA. Then, two days after Zaydan and Strangberg were taken out, the Shadow Client raided a bank vault in New York using the keys he obtained from Heijun and a man named Cobb. One of my people has gone missing in Johannesburg. A key bearer. I wish I'd been informed. Still, the system demands two keys, and the rest are all accounted for. Except for your late predecessors. Cobb? But... this plane went down over the Pacific. It was an accident. Such was the conclusion at the time, yes. People die, Mr. Fannin. Happens all the time, even to us. It seems like a conspiracy. Probably isn't. And yet, a failed coup in Morocco. The ether virus. Someone knows about us. There was a pattern and I failed to see it. Providence is under attack. <clears throat> How much was there? Money. <laughs> Not money, Mr. Fannin. 
information on all of our assets and operatives, like you. Dig a trench, Director, and make it a deep one, because none of you are safe anymore. With Bangkok, the Shadow Client facilitated the assassination of Jordan Cross as a way to lure Thomas Cross out of hiding. The Shadow Client's militia then facilitated the abduction of Thomas Cross, all facilitated by one person. Well, and one other person, but let's continue. The other person that I'm referring to is a young hacker named Olivia Hall. ICA followed the trail of information that Olivia sent to their clients and tracked her to a farm in Colorado, USA. The ICA believe that the Shadow Client's militia, the one that facilitated the kidnapping of Thomas Cross, are operating out of this farm. There's no client for this contract. The request for this mission had been ordered by the board of the ICA, or more specifically, ICA director Eric Soders, which Diana considers rash and a hasty move by Soders. Nonetheless, they have their orders and 47 is required to infiltrate the farm compound, then take out the militia leader Sean Rose, who the ICA suspect could be the Shadow Client himself, the next Mossad operative named Ezra Berg, their strategic advisor Penelope Graves, and finally the militia's training instructor Maya Pavati. After taking out all of the targets, 47 manages to find a command centre. What they find in there shocks them. Sean Rose was not the Shadow Client. That much is clear. Whoever commands the militia, they got out just in time. Look around, 47. We're getting closer. Some kind of network. Power players from all sectors. Familiar faces too. Thomas Cross, Klaus Strandberg, Ether, and that's missing banker Eugene Cobb. Well, well. There's a name. Providence. What? No. No, it can't be. The hidden hand. Thought they were a myth. A hypothesis, nothing more. The idea that a small cabal of kingmakers controlling enough corporate and political leaders could effectively run the world in secret. Maybe not so hypothetical. Keep looking, 47. We need full disclosure. Someone's done their homework. Look how far it dates back. Hayamoto, Beldingford, Delvade. The Shadow Client has been tracking you for decades. Now, how is that possible? It isn't. Every one of those missions were branded as unsolved or accidents. He must have been looking for a pattern, a certain M.O., which would mean... He knows me. Well, at least this shortens the list. Found something. So does. But that would mean... Providence has infiltrated ICA, and Eric Sodas is their operative. Bastard! It all fits. He was the one who persuaded the rest of the ICA board to greenlight this operation. This changes everything. Get out, 47. We got what we came for. What about the Shadow Clan? He is no longer our primary concern. ICA has been compromised. I always wondered if Providence was real, but I never actually... I will need to confer with the board, but mark my words, 47. This will have consequences. As 47 leaves the farm, he's being watched by the Shadow Client through the sight of a sniper rifle. The Shadow Client is talking to Olivia, and she's upset and concerned that her mistakes led to the ICA finding the militia's camp. She's concerned that 47 will be coming for her next, and asks the Shadow Client to kill him. But the Shadow Client tells her a story about his childhood. I ran away as a boy. My friend and I, away from that place. We came upon a small farming community. The people were dirt poor, but this woman, she took us in. We were awakened the next morning by the shots. A dozen people lay face down in the snow. Our warden didn't like to leave witnesses. They shot the woman and her family last. They made sure that we watched the whole thing. This is your gift, the warden told us. Your gift and your curse. Touching lives only by ending them.
better than anyone. Sound familiar? After leaving the farm, 47 is headed to Hokkaido in Japan. True to Diana's earlier suspicions, ICA director Eric Sodas was up to something. He defected to Providence. Truth is that Sodas is dying. He suffers from a condition named Situs Inversus, meaning that his organs are back to front. He needs a heart transplant, his second one. These aren't cheap and so does his skint due to gambling, and this is where Providence come in. Providence run a fancy private hospital in Hokkaido called Gamma. After the ICA dug into Soda's private affairs, it seems that he's been fast-tracked for critical heart surgery. Since he can't pay for it, the ICA deduced that he's defected to Providence and have greenlit him for termination. Also joining Soda's on the hit list is a top trial lawyer from Tokyo named Yuki Yamazaki. It shouldn't surprise you at this point to know that she's a secret Providence operative. She is known as a messenger of Providence, people they call heralds, basically a middleman between the leader of Providence, a person known as the Constant, and Providence operatives. Remember Heijun? He was one of these heralds, as was Cobb. It's clear that Yuki is there at Gamma to obtain information from Sodas in relation to the ICA. And that can't happen, so Yuki's gotta go. Whichever way 47 chooses to do it, he manages to eliminate both of his targets and leaves the facility. Just as a side note, some people believe that Sodas himself could well be the mystery man from Silent Assassin. Let me know what you think down below. The finale of the game then plays out with Diana on a train. Miss Burnwood. That's not what my ticket says. We received your message. Loud and clear, I might add. Honestly, you could have just sacked the poor guy. I didn't catch your name. No, you didn't. There'll be no retaliation, not for Soders, nor any other recent fiascos. Someone's been meddling in our affairs, killing our operatives, and making the ICA look like fools. I think you got close to that someone, closer than we've ever been. That's why we're hiring you to take him down. I don't think so. Don't rattle our cages, Miss Burnwood. You really have no idea. You spy on us, bribe our people, and you have the gall to demand our help. No. We can't be trusted. Even so, we've been around for a long, long time. I think we could help each other. Some 20 years ago, your agency took in a young man with no past and extraordinary skills. In his own special way, he cares about you and vice versa. And ever since that time, you've never stopped wondering where he came from and who made him what he is. There was a doctor, some depraved experiment, but he's gone now. Ah. Well, if you believe the questions died with him, we have nothing further to discuss. If not, as I said, I think we could help each other. Partners, then. Cheer up, Miss Burnwood. We... We are the lesser evil. This terrorist. He wants nothing but chaos. He's only a terrorist if you win. Miss Burnwood, we won a long time ago. This... This is maintenance.
Leading us into the events of Hitman 2 now, Diana has managed to convince the ICA to accept the contract offered by Providence, for the ICA to eliminate the Shadow Client and take down his militia. Using the information 47 found on the militia's farm in Colorado, they managed to track down a key member of said militia, a woman named Alma Reynard. She was also the girlfriend of Sean Rose. 47 infiltrates a beach house in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand, and uses Alma's computer, but doesn't find anything on the Shadow Client. He does, however, find a message from the CEO of Kronstadt Industries, Robert Knox. Knox was a Providence operative, but it seems he's made contact with the Shadow Client's militia through Alma Reynard. 47 is tasked with taking her out, and does so. Diana contacts 47 and they discuss the client, that the hit on Alma Reynard impressed Providence and that they want them to take down the entire militia and the Shadow Client, then 47 asks this. A week ago, Providence was a threat. How did you swing the board? The board are practical people, 47. A blank check is hard to turn down. Besides, the Shadow Client's war on Providence is causing a global panic. Someone will need to stop the militia. Might as well be us. And the man on the train? You never told them about his offer. Taking a contract for personal gain is against ICA regulations. Sodas would have been proud. Is that a sense of humor, 47? Whatever next, crying at the movies? Why are you doing this? I know what it's like to have everything taken from you. He claims to know about your past, your childhood, your memories, everything Ortmeier stole from you. And you trust him? About as far as I can throw him. But this is our best lead in 20 years. I say it's time we break a few rules. The ICA fired through the data recovered from Alma Reynard's computer by 47 and find that their suspicions were correct. Robert Knox, along with his race car driving daughter Sierra Knox, have decided to betray Providence and defect to the Shadow Client's militia. They were worried that the Shadow Client would target them next, so they cut a deal, so to speak. Given that Kronstadt Industries developed next generation military tech, Providence is concerned that Kronstadt will use this military tech and arm the militia, increasing their capacity for more attacks. Therefore, Providence requests that both Robert Knox and Sierra Knox are eliminated. The perfect cover for this is the annual global innovation race in Miami. 47 gets to work and takes out both Robert and Sierra. The man from the train then meets with the highest leaders in Providence, a group known as the Partners. They are first concerned that their operatives are being killed, but the man from the train calms them. Berlin. Shanghai. We're bleeding operatives. Panic is spreading, and now we are axing our own? Knox was a traitor. He would have caused incalculable damage. We need to fight the sickness, not the symptom. And I have just the tool for the job. Right. The Burnwood woman. Fact remains, we are shadowboxing. We need to know who we are up against. His name is Lucas Gray, the late Mr. Cobb's head of security. Cobb was ground zero. First of our operatives to die, Gray is a mercenary. A veteran of every backwater tragedy you've ever ignored on the five o'clock news. I couldn't give two shits where he came from. I only want to know one thing. How does he know about us? So now we have a name for the Shadow Client, Lucas Gray. I swear to God, this hearts and flowers crap will get us both killed. Can't you see? Your so-called friend is working for them now. He's not the man you knew. This is his fight too, Olivia. Even if he doesn't realize it. Like it or not, 47 is our last and only lead on the partners. He needs to remember. He's coming for us. And unlike you, he won't hesitate. Just get me inside. Rico. I need a favor. Rico is the nephew of Don Fernando Delgado, whom 47 took out along with his son Manuel in Chile. 
Lucas Gray was using Rico's drug smuggling operation to transport the militia around the world to carry out their attacks. Naturally, Delgado has made it onto Providence's shit list, so he needs to be assassinated along with his assistants Andrea Martinez and Jorge Franco, a gifted chemist. 47 heads to Colombia and takes all the targets out. Shortly after this, Diana is now in Surrey, England. She is at a cemetery and tells Providence that the hit in Colombia was successful. She visits the grave of someone called James Burnwood who died at age 9, her brother. Diana's flashback reveals that her brother died as a result of a leak from a lab for which a company named Blue Seed Pharmaceuticals were responsible. Diana's parents were taking the company to court. Blue Seed weren't taking this though and had both of her parents killed by a car bomb, revealing that Diana is visiting the graves of her mother, father and brother. We'll cover this in more detail later in the video. Whilst this is happening, Lucas Gray is in Johannesburg. He's stolen a vial of something from the Ether Biotech Corporation. We got what we came for. Move out. Providence then sends 47 to Mumbai, India next. It seems the militia released a hostage tape basically telling the world Providence really does exist. Remember the hit that Providence referred to in Shanghai? Well a militia operative known only as the Maelstrom was involved, along with two former members of his private gang. A bandit named Vanya Shah, and a Bollywood film producer named Dawood Rangan who has been helping take out Providence operatives in Asia. 47 takes out all the targets including the Maelstrom. Not long after the Mumbai job, Diana and 47 get a lead on Lucas Gray. He bought the burnt out derelict remains of the Institute for Human Betterment in Romania under the guise of an anonymous investor, leading 47 right there. Although remember that 47's memory was wiped by Ortmeier shortly after his escape, so he can't really remember what happened there. 47 enters the building. And even now, you don't remember. This place. This was our prison, where father trained us, shaped us into killers for providence. Now, you don't remember, they ripped it out of you, wiped it away, but I do. I remember everything. an incident. That boy, he died. He lived because of you. Don't you remember his name? You know this. Deep down, you know. What was his name? Subject 6. Your name is Subject 6. And what is our purpose? to take them all down. We were going to tear it all down. The Institute, Providence, everyone who'd ever hurt us. We failed. The partners grew paranoid, made sure that Ortmeier's children would never challenge them again. I'm the only one who got away unchanged. The only one left who remembers. What Maya was Providence. Everything he did to us, everything he made us do, it all leads back to them. The partners hide behind a cloak of anonymity. Only one man knows their true identities. Your client, the top controller, the one they call the Constant. He is the key. <laughs> but he is untraceable. So what am I missing? A man would come to the Institute man with a providence pin, the first constant. If we find him, if he's still alive, he's our way in. 
You don't know who he is, but 47 does. That's what this reunion is all about. 47's memory was erased, irreversibly at the time. But after Ortmeier's death, his estate was acquired by the Ether Corporation, and they made an antidote. Subject 47, most gifted of all my boys. So you're the pick of the litter. Tell me about the incident. The subject ran away, he and another boy. The instigator was punished accordingly, as were all the neighbors. My men did what needed to be done. It won't happen again. Bring your house in order, Doctor. You won't like the alternative. I remember who he is. Well, well, Ort Meyer was a member of Providence, and on top of that, 47 is starting to get his memories back. Lucas, Gray, and 47 are now working together to try and take down Providence. 47 remembers who the first Providence constant was a KGB Cold War defector codenamed Janus, who in 1989 was the man who ordered Ortmeier to wipe all the subject's memories. It also appears that when Ortmeier wiped 47's memory, as seen in Birth of the Hitman, he falsely told 47 that he killed his tormentor subject 6, but obviously that didn't happen at all. Therefore 47's recollection of 6 tormenting him and him killing 6 was actually what 47 was led to believe. Diana doctors an ITA report to make it seem that Janus was himself the shadow client and that Lucas Gray was just following orders. And like clockwork, Providence greenlit Janus for termination. Well, him and yet another Providence Herald named Nolan Cassidy, who was himself on duty when Vice President Daniel Morris was assassinated by 47 way back in 2005. Anyway, Janus has been living in an idyllic suburb in Vermont in 2004 but he's currently under heavy guard and protection ever since the attacks on Providence. After taking out the old man along with Nolan Cassidy, 47 discovers a clue. Janus was planning to meet with the current Constant at a party held by a Providence group called the Ark Society. This is a survivalist club for the global elite where, in the case of a global disaster, the members of the Ark Society will attempt to ensure their survival. Janus was their founder and Olivia deduces that the Ark Society will probably want to meet in order to pay their respects. What's more is that the current constant is a man called Arthur Edwards. He's the man that approached Diana on the train at the end of the previous game. Now, although IO Interactive released the Ambrose Island mission after Hitman 3 came out, it actually happens here in the timeline. So after Lucas Gray left for Romania, he left his militia in the hands of a man named Noel Crest. Crest was ordered to cease all attacks on Providence, but he didn't, he continued them, and over the next two months, the militia have gone rogue and joined forces with a pirate syndicate, and they plan to raid a ship which is due to pass the island. So, Crest needs to be taken out. 47 also needs to take out one of the pirates, a woman named Sini Venthan. 47 is tasked with destroying a satellite control unit for a satellite linked to the Ether Corporation's data. Very sensitive stuff. 47 completes his mission and meets an old friend. Agent Smith seems to have gotten himself in yet another spot of bother. So given that a couple of months have passed, they track the coffin and discover that Janus's remains were shipped to an obscure island called the Isle of Scale. Their plan is to infiltrate the event and to take out sisters Zoe and Sophia Washington, who are the new joint chairwomen of the Ark Society. It gets more complicated. The Constant, under orders from the partners of Providence, has embedded a poisoned chip in his neck as a failsafe in case he is compromised, and both sisters have the kill switch. The team's final goal is to extract the Constant. 47 takes out both sisters, preventing them from triggering the Constant's kill switch, and they take him to a ship in the North Sea. Three families. That's all it took. The Ingrams, the Carlisles, the Stuyvesants. Three dynasties secretly pooling their resources over generations creating a singularity so dense that nothing escapes its gravity. Never heard of them. 
Well, they've heard of you. In fact, you just became the top of their agenda. So now we know the identities of the partners. Three families, with each family having a representative who would be the partner. 47 and Lucas Grey leave the ship in order to carry out the next part of their plan to take down Providence. They're going to go after the three families. Then a shocking reveal. He never fails, does he? He never misses his mark. You found a window into his past. And yet, something else remains hidden. A simple truth you learned long ago. Diana! Coming! I put off making a section about Diana until this point. To learn a big part of Diana's backstory, we need to dive back into the birth of the Hitman comic book. As we just found out, 47 was responsible for the death of Diana's parents. As we also know, this was due to a pharmaceutical company called Blue Seed having Diana's parents assassinated after they threatened to take Blue Seed down after an accidental poisoning of the water supply which claimed Diana's younger brother James. But we can now find out what happened in the gap between this happening and Diana recruiting 47 into the ICA in 1999. So after the assassination, 47 and Subject 6 return to the Institute, and Diana, still in Surrey and living with her extended family, vows revenge on the people who are responsible for the death of her parents. She walks the streets at night in the hope of finding some answers, and one evening is chased by a couple of thugs, leading to her meeting a crime boss called Savvy. Over time, Savvy mentors Diana and eventually Savvy finds a lead, an executive from Blue Seed Pharmaceuticals. Diana tries to interrogate the executive, but Savvy bizarrely has the man shot in the head by a sniper before he can tell her anything. Diana now needs Savvy out of the way, and money talks, so she pays two of Savvy's thugs to help her get rid of her, and this eventually ends up in Savvy's death. Around four or five years later in 1994, Diana is in university studying psychology. Over those years, she had the most of the Blue Seeds executives taken care of, paying for these hits through taking over Savvy's gun running business. Another four years later, in 1998, Diana finds another Blue Seed member, but the hit goes wrong. She eventually plans to attack the executive's home and does so, but is helped by someone from the shadows. Remember Eric Soders from the Hokkaido mission? He was a prolific assassin back in the day, considered to be the best of his generation. It was here that Sodas hired Diana to work for the ICA, but as a handler and not an assassin. Anyway, it was also around this time, all the way over in Romania, that 47 would have his memory wiped. Diana is offered a contract to handle on Franklin Marchand, who we discussed earlier. As mentioned earlier, it's here that they meet for the very first time. And then, as we know, this leads to 47 arriving at the secret ICA facility in 1999 in the Hitman prologue. But anyway, that's enough for that section, let's continue on. Okay, so it seems that with the capture of the Constant, the partners had died. Records falsified in order to try and throw the team off the scent. They're trying to cover their tracks. The Constant tells the team to follow the money. And this thread leads them to an investment bank called Milton Fitzpatrick, at which the partners hold accounts. And the bank manager is a Providence operative named Athena Savalas, which needs to be terminated. 47 also needs to obtain three hard drives containing the information for all three partners and their new identities. After this is a success, the data leads the team to an island in the Maldives. This paradise is home to a rather shady operation though. A corporation called Haven, which specialises in helping rich criminals disappear and gives them new identities. 47 goes to the island as Tobias Reaper, a criminal looking to disappear, and takes out the company's CEO Tyson Williams their IT expert Stephen Bradley, and Haven's client coordinator Ludmilla Vitrova. Olivia is able to hack into the Haven servers. You found them? Yeah, right here. But, oh wait a minute, something's off. See here, all those controlling shares, those are basically the backbone of the Providence Empire, but, but they're not going to the new partner identities. What do you mean? I mean, they're allocated to someone else. Everything is. The partners are, are left with no real control. Who is Arthur Edwards? The Constant. Message from Olivia. 
Everything's going to plan. We know where the partners are. We have our targets. You're almost there, old friend. Feels... good, doesn't it? We should head out before the storm hits. Time to fulfill our purpose, 47. To take them all down. Continuing on from previous events, 47 and Lucas Grey head to Dubai. All three partners are due to meet at an event in Dubai's tallest building named the Scepter. An event is being hosted by Sheikh Omar Al Ghazali. But as 47 and Grey skydive towards the building, a helicopter comes out of nowhere. It's Alexa Carlyle, one of the partners. She has left in a hurry. This is because she has found out that Arthur Edwards has not only escaped, but is seizing control of Providence and she needs to contain the damage. Their mission still remains though as the other two partners are there in the Scepter. 47 duly ends their existence. After their successful mission, Grey makes it clear that he doesn't trust Diana at all. He's suspicious about the manner in which the Constant was able to escape. Olivia has managed to track Alexa Carlyle, the final partner, to her family's estate in Dartmoor, England. Whilst they are travelling there, Diana takes a call from Arthur Edwards. Miss Burnwood. How did you... I have everyone's number. You really ought to know by now. You planned this. All of it. Don't be silly. I just played the hand I was dealt. We'll find you. You had me. Where'd that get you? We handed you an empire. It's for the best. The partners were complacent set in their ways but power is more than just security providence can be an agent of change surely you understand or you will soon enough alexa carlisle startled her family when she turned up as they thought she was dead but carlisle knows that 47 and gray are coming for her she is attempting to stop edwards taking control of providence 47 and Grey arrive at Carlisle's Thornbridge Manor, which quite ironically was the birthplace of Providence itself. 47 receives a case file on Arthur Edwards and manages to take Alexa out, but he unexpectedly loses contact with Diana. Then 47 hears Lucas Grey over his radio. 47, don't respond, just listen. Diana can't help you now. You need to find Olivia. She will know what to do. I wish there had been more time. Stay down. Boss wants you alive. Yeah? How about now? Over here! Cover me! Walk away! <laughs> Or what? You gonna take us all on? Don't. Yeah! Tell the Constant to start running! You think you've won? 47 is out there. And 47 never misses his mark. Neither do you, Miss Burnwood. That's what makes you valuable. You're delusional. You think I would betray 47? Trust me, you owe him nothing. What is this? I told you we could help each other, and I meant it. I look forward to your call. Gray is gone. Go to Berlin and stay out of sight. So with Gray dead, 47 heads to Berlin as instructed to meet Olivia. He sees a dead agent and is contacted by Olivia over the phone. We've been compromised. Aboard and walk away now. Who? ICA. They tracked me. Don't know how. It's what they do. How many? One prime asset and a whole pack of up-and-comers. They've infiltrated the club searching for us. Christ, I think I killed one of them. Get out now before they spot you. No. They found us once. They'll find us again. <sighs> Keep your head down. I'll take care of this. With the ICA agents actively looking for Olivia and 47, 
47 enters a nearby nightclub and tracks each and every one of the undercover ICA agents, eliminating them all. 47 then tells Olivia that she is now safe and goes to meet up with her at a nearby bar. You're hurt. You should see the other guy. Never killed nobody before. What you did back there. You really are all Grace said you'd be. 47. He didn't suffer, did he? He made it count. Bruised, but not broken. I'm glad. It's time we start afresh, you and me. Get to the point. You and your friends pulled off the impossible. You stormed the heavens, took down the untouchables, and yet, here we are. As the next constant, you can be the agent of change. I'll need to think about it. No, you won't. The real question is, what will you bring to the table? So whilst Edwards is trying to tap up Diana to be the next constant of Providence, 47 and Olivia realise that the file he took from Thornbridge Manor is pretty much useless. It tells them nothing about how to find the constant. The ICA are remotely hacking Olivia's files, so as a last resort they head to an ICA facility in Quanjing, China, which is run by a cyber terrorist called Hush. Their plan is to leak all of the client data along with all previous ICA targets. It's a data facility. 47 eliminates two targets, Imogen Royce, an ICA analyst, and of course Hush himself, as 47 needs access to the biometric lock on the facility's data core. He then infiltrates the data facility and accesses the data core. It's all here. Clients, operatives, every hit the ICA ever sanctioned. Enough to shut them down for good. But first you need to locate all files referencing Diana and yourself. Why you want to protect her. So, wipe all the data referring to the two of you from their system before we publish the rest. Okay, good. I've set up a link to an information non-profit site. When you press that button, it's up there and the whole world will know. There's no undo 47. This will shut the ICA down for good. You really okay with this? It's who you've been for so long. Maybe it's time for a change. I'll just return things to normal. No need to alert them we were here prematurely. Detected. Shit. I missed that. We're blown for you. I can hold the doors for a little while. Use the fence to get out. Go. Despite the trap, 47 manages to evade the guards and escapes after Olivia remotely sets the facility on fire. The ICA have effectively been destroyed. You win. So, what happens now? The ball's in your court, Miss Burnwood. I do have other candidates, you know. Most of whom have never tied me to a chair. You've seen the news. That was 47 acting on his own. He is untethered. He is unstoppable, and he cannot be bargained with. He will find you, Mr. Edwards, and I'm the only chance you've got. I'm listening. 47 has one weakness. Me. Olivia informs 47 that Diana is headed to an event hosted by Don Archibald Yates at his vineyard in Mendoza, Argentina. 
47 arrives there and immediately meets with Diana in an attempt to find out where her allegiances really lie. Diana informs 47 of her intention to infiltrate Providence and tear it apart from the inside. 47, whilst he is at the event, needs to help facilitate this by eliminating the top candidate to be the next constant, who is Don Yates himself, and 47 needs to eliminate ex-CIA agent Tamara Vidal, who is now a Providence Herald. Getting these two out of the way will all but guarantee that Diana becomes the next constant. 47, after taking out the two targets, meets with Diana, and she asks him to meet her by the olive grove at sunset. How did you know? Your deal. That kind of power always comes with a price. What's yours? I think you know. I'm sorry. This is a necessary evil. What have you done? Ether Brown's neurotoxin, transfers by touch. See, Edwards learns by his mistakes, 47. And as you've clearly demonstrated, brute force is futile. It had to be me. It was the only way. To get this close. My family. I know what you did. After all these years, I finally know. I am sorry. You didn't have a choice. I did. Providence used you, but I'm no better. All I saw was a blank slate, a weapon to wield. I told myself it was what you needed, but people aren't meant to be controlled. Goodbye, Agent. 47 then relives a series of flashbacks in which he's being tormented by Diana's betrayal and his past, including what he did to Diana's parents. Although not really crucial to the storyline per se, this is where we get a glimpse into 47's psyche by discovering more about him through the Seven Deadly Sins contracts. This is explored through a series of bizarre but cool contracts in which 47 must take out specific targets in very specific ways. Anyway, Grey appears as the voice of reason, and 47 starts to realise that he needs to embrace the past. Similar to what Diana did in Blood Money, Diana made it look like she betrayed 47. Made it seem like she'd picked a side. 47 comes to and is on an operating table somewhere. He goes outside and discovers that he's on a guarded train operated by the Ether Corporation, which is hurtling through the Carpathian Mountains of Romania. Eventually, after a perilous journey through and on top of the train, 47 confronts Arthur Edwards. I don't suppose there's any point calling for help. No. Seems I brought this on myself. Well played, Miss Burnwood. Do you really think she'll be able to resist all that power? This is not how people work. She rejects the power, not the responsibility. <laughs> A noble idea. But please join me in the real world. I trust you already know what this is. Why not simply take it? Embrace who you were always meant to be. No, never again. <sighs> well, I had to try. Go on then. Do your thing. Now, there's three endings available here. 47 can choose to simply kill Edwards, inject himself, which results in 47's memory being wiped and him waking up back in the asylum again. This is more of an Easter egg ending, as Arthur Edwards says the exact same thing as Ortmeier did in Codename 47. Wake up. Wake up, my friend. Given that Hitman 3 is the latest instalment in the story, we are yet to see which ending is canonical in terms of Arthur Edwards' fate, but the most fitting end, for me at least, is that 47 injects Edwards with the serum. What are you doing? No! No! This is what it means to lose everything. You're making a mistake. It's mine to make. 
Oh. <laughs> Forgive me. I seem to have, uh... What were we talking about? Don't worry. We were done. 47 then stops and leaves the train, walking off into the distance. Diana then, as promised, takes down Providence from the inside, and in her cabin she burns the contract which resulted in the death of her parents. Then, an entire year later, 47 arrives at Diana's cabin and speaks to her on the phone. It's been a long time, Agent 47. That's not who I am anymore. The pact is done. The past. Death. And yet, here you are. I choose this path because I can. There will always be people like them. So there will always be people like us. No one is untouchable. It's good to be back. The game then ends. And that is the entire story of Hitman so far. If you enjoyed this video then please leave a like on it and subscribe to the channel. Please go and check out my other entire stories videos on Outlast, Metro and Mafia if you haven't already. Leave a comment down below with your thoughts but for now take care and I will see you in the next one.